I will. Will, can you record? I'm ready. Here we go. Hi, my name is Roger Green. I'm on the board of the Friends and Foundation of the Albany Public Library. We, we help support programs of the library. And our speaker today is Dr. Alice Green, who's the executive director of the Center for Law and Justice. She has a very long resume, which I will not read to you because we don't have that kind of time. Oh, good. But she has a doctorate <laughs> in criminal justice, three master's degrees. She writes <laughs> lectures on racism and criminal justice issues. She's authored the book, Law Never Here, a social history of African-American responses to the issues of crime and justice, plus <laughs> other books. And she has received numerous awards. In 2018, she was designated a literary legend by the Albany Public Library Foundation, in part <coughs> due to her founding editing of the South End Scene and other publications. And I introduce to you, Alice Green. Okay, well, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I'm gonna apologize. I've been talking so much that I think I'm losing my voice. I'm about to get laryngitis. So uh, bear with me. Um, but uh, I'm so happy to see there's so many people. I thought there'd be two or three people, but this is incredible. Uh, and it, I'm really happy to have been invited again to present my <clears throat> perspective on another favorite book of mine. I've done these for the uh, Friends of the Library over a number of years. So, um, and I'm a little hesitant to label it a, a book review necessarily, but I, but I do want to thank Jean Dam for uh, the invite to do a book review. Um, evidently, he heard me uh, recommend Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast the Origin of Our Discontent, on a program I did on WAMC. And I recommended the book uh, while discussing uh, Black community relations and systemic racism. And I felt it was important that people read this book. Uh, it has um, received a great deal of attention since its publication, I think it was last summer. So uh, CAST is now number two on the New York Times bestseller list. I saw on that on Sunday with um, uh, Barack Obama's A Promised Land in first place. So. Uh, and many have deemed the, this book a classic with several calling it the most important book of the decade. Whether you agree with that or not, that's what people are, are referring to it as. Um, by the way, it, have um, most of you read the book? Oh. Okay. Some of you have. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to leave a few minutes for discussion. Um, I do wanna to mention, um, that Frank uh, Robinson has done a review of this book, which I think is great. Uh, to no surprise, uh, my perspective on this book reflects uh, a number of things. It, it reflects my interest, my work, my blackness, and my commitment to criminal and social justice. So my hope was that this book, when I saw it, would expand my understanding of American history and our current situation uh, filled with, uh, you know, uh, with a number of concerns that I have. I was hoping that this book was gonna help me deal with things like uh, uh, how do we see uh, racism, white supremacy, uh, police brutality, uh, Trumpism, the Black Lives Matter movement, January 6th and much more. So uh, I was asking a lot of this book but CAS has certainly promoted um, lively conversations and, and heated discussions. Uh, I've been in on a few uh, among my associates and friends. And it's forced me to re-examine some of my thoughts and beliefs about these issues and influences. Um, well, to, to briefly state the basic concept of CAS that I, I drew from, from the book, uh, Wilkerson tells us that we all instinctively and often subconsciously uh, place each other in a value-laden hierarchical position, sort of in our mind, but it's there, um, or that's what a caste is, and it's based on race. 
white sardine uh, superior with others seen as inferior to them. And that, that's the basic thing. But personally, I was able to endorse and connect with her assertion because from my own experience, it has always seemed to me that I am automatically assigned a lower, less valued place in the American social structure because of my birth as a black person while whites <clears throat> seem to me to always be assigned to a higher place because of their whiteness. Um, this perspective of mine forms the base of Wilkinson's American caste system. It, it adds another term to consider when we speak of the concepts of race, bias, prejudice, racism, systemic racism, class, and white supremacy. These are all terms that you know, are out there now and people are uh, trying to figure out what they all mean. And her book challenges us to define and understand the connection or, or the relationship of, of uh, many of these terms. Um, I just want to mention uh, uh, a little bit about the author before we talk about it. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson, if you haven't guessed, <laughs> is a black writer whose uh, debut book was The Warmth of Other Suns. And I think uh, the library reviewed that at one point. And it, it's about a great, the great black migration from the American South during uh, much of the 20th century. And uh, in that book, she demonstrated her great gift of storytelling. I think that helps readers understand the human impact of social policies, uh, practices and movements. Uh, some are critical of the stories that she chooses, uh, but the book, uh, that book earned her the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction. And she's also a Pulitzer Prize winner uh, for journalism. And warmth led her to, so write this, she claims that, that it led her to write her current book um, on the American uh, caste system. And there is a, a local connection, maybe some, maybe I got this wrong, but somebody told me and I'll mention it, <laughs> that the author has, uh, she has a, a local connection. Uh, she's married to Roderick Watt, whose parents I am told are Robert K. Watts of Albany and Eva Lacey Watts of Schenectady. Does anybody know if that's true? Somebody told me that, <laughs> um, haven't been able to verify it. Uh, anyways. Um, I was immediately drawn to Wilkinson's book because of the cast title. Although the concept, uh, you know, has rarely, if ever, um, uh, been included in a number of the public dialogues and discussions that I ha I've had about race, um, I have long been interested in and, and actually fascinated by the concept. And I was introduced to it in books uh, films, stories about India's untouchables. I think many other people were as well. And th those untouchables were really a segment of the country's population that was deemed unworthy of and prohibited from contact with all other people, uh, uh, all other groups. Uh, then I, I did read some books, I'll just, a couple of books that I'll just mention and I won't go into them, but uh, John Dollard, I think he, his book was written in 1943. It's called Cast and Class in a Small Southern Town. Um, and also there's one by a Trinidadian American, Oliver Cromwell Cox. And his book is entitled Cast, Class and Race, a study in social dynamics. And, and I think that was written in 1948. But you see in both of these books uh, and other books that have been written about caste, they also include uh, cat, uh, class, which, uh, well, I'll get to that later, but that's, uh, Isabel has not really dealt with that issue. <laughs> and that's a source of criticism. Um, there was a more recent book that presents the concept of caste in the context of criminal justice. And the new, uh, it's, it looks at the new system of Jim Crow, uh, which Michelle Alexander talks about in her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. She, she argues that the American uh, criminal justice system has created a, a caste system 
in which formerly incarcerated Blacks are locked into the system. That is, they become permanently imprisoned in their own communities. And we certainly see evidence of this in the work that I do, uh, because it's very difficult for people who have been incarcerated to come back into their community and become a real part of that community. Um, Wilkinson um, does maintain that racism, which you know the most popular term used to describe uh, the disturbing relationship in this country between blacks and whites in America is not sufficient to describe the force that heavily defines and influences you know, that, that very troubling relationship. And she defines racism, and I'll, I'll think I could read a little bit of what she said, uh, as any action or institution that mocks, harms, assumes or attaches inferiority or stereotypes on the basis of race. Race is also seen as fluid and superficial and subject to redefinition to fit the needs of the dominant class. For example, she notes that the definition of who is white has changed in this country over time. Because uh, at, one, at one time, as you probably know, Italians and Jews and other groups uh, were not considered white. Um, I, I lived in a town up in the north where all of the, it was a, there were a number of people from different countries and ethnicities, and um, they identified themselves as white. But some of them, when they got to Albany and want to take advantage of the affirmative action program, all of a sudden became uh, of color. Um, and she goes on to, to note that social scientists see racism as is really the combination of racial bias and systemic power. And increasingly it is seen as a, a sort of like a feeling or a character flaw. But racism alone, she says, cannot describe the full extent of America's problem with race. Um, so she, she, she does that and then she goes on to define uh, the, uh, the caste system. And I'll just read a little bit from that. Um, she sees it as an artificial construction, a fixed and embedded ranking of human value that sets the presumed supremacy of one group against the presumed inferiority of other groups on the basis of ancestry and often other immutable um, traits, traits that would be neutral in the abstract but are ascribed life and death meaning in a hierarchy favoring the dominant caste whose forebears designed it. So a caste system uses rigid, often arbitrary boundaries to keep uh, the rank groups, as, as she talks about them, apart. And uh, they're distinct from one another and, uh, and in their own assigned places. And she, she goes on to assert that the hierarchy of caste is not about feelings or morality, it's about power and resources you know, which groups have them and which do not. In the American caste system, race is the signal of rank. It's the primary tool and the signal decoy, she calls it. Caste like grammar becomes the invisible guide. Caste is the powerful infrastructure that holds each group in its place. It is fixed and rigid to the point that we in this country, blacks and whites react almost instinctively and subconsciously to race. So that, I mean, that's her, her, uh, her definition of what this caste system is. And, um, it, you know, it's critical, um, to, it's critical to understand that what this deeply embedded infrastructure of the American hierarchy sort of looks like. And uh, to, so to expand our understanding of caste, she briefly examines caste systems in three countries that stigmatized uh, identified groups of people in, and in order to human, dehumanize them because dehumanization is a big part of this. She draws parallels in each of, of these uh, 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 countries and extracts and identifies uh, eight uh, protocols or what she calls pillars that are used to enforce these castes that help define and explain the American caste system. And I'll just briefly mention what they are. 
Um, one is uh, divine will and laws of nature. That is, all human positions in life are governed by some high, higher power. And Blacks seem to be damned and doomed because they supposedly descended from Ham, the curse, cursed son of Noah. Uh, a second one is birth and heritability. People, in other words, are born into their permanent caste. You just can't get out of it. Um, the third one uh, she talks about is endogamy and the control of marriage and mating. Miscegenation laws are a perfect example of this. Um, the fourth one is purity of uh, dominant class versus pollution from inferiors. In other words, the higher class believes itself to be pure and they fear pollution from the lower class, uh, touching them or drinking from something <laughs> that they've uh, touched. And it's believed that a black person, and we've seen this in, in this country, um, and it's been very dramatic, they can pollute things like pools, lakes, water fountains, and blood. Uh, hence, you probably uh, are aware of uh, the uh, one drop rule that was uh, in this country. Um, if you have one drop of blood, you are considered black and you are inferior. Uh, the fifth one uh, refers to occupational hierarchy. The lower class is considered to be born to fulfill uh, the lowest task. Professionals versus social providers. One ex example of this that, that I refer to a lot is Brian Stevens, uh, who, as you know, is an attorney. Um, and he it talks about his book of uh, being mistaken in the courtroom for the defendant instead of the defendant's lawyer. We don't expect, we didn't expect him to be where he is. Um, then of course, dehumanization is the sixth one and stigma. Um, a lower class members are not to be seen as human. The safe system in this country stripped the enslaved blacks of their humanity and treated them like property. Uh, and that's, that's one example, but also during the Jewish Holocaust, Jews were stripped of their possessions and branded like, like cattle. Um, then the seventh, the seventh pillar uh, refers to terror as enforcement and control. Uh, there is the, the, you know, the use of violence uh, by upper class to control the lower caste. Blacks certainly experience this in this country that brutalized during enslavement and of course uh, during a reconstruction by groups like KKK. And we we'll start to see this emerge again in this country. Um, and then there's the, the, la the last one is uh, the concepts of inherent superiority versus inherent inferiority. Blacks continue to be taught that they are inferior, often in you know, very subtle ways. Uh, we're now uh, talking a lot about the Confederate statues and, and that, the meaning that for that um, and how and why so many people are opposed to uh, honoring those statues, because it reminds them of uh, that superiority, inferiority uh, divide. Um, so one of the things she does after that is she, she uh, you know, comes up with some examples uh, using her uh, storytelling skills. She uh, presents a number of life situations that exemplify how these pillars play out in real life. For me, I, I think I'll just mention one because it, to me that was most heart-wrenching is one of, about purity. Um, and also it has a, a, a great significance when we look at the uh, Jim Crow South. Uh, and it also uh, said, uh, sheds some light on the problem of why there is a disproportionate number of blacks who are, who are non-swimmers, by the way. She tells the story of what happened to a young black boy in 1951 in Youngstown, Ohio, I think it was. And his little league baseball team won the city championship 
And unthinkingly, the coaches decided to celebrate their win with a team picnic at a, um, I think it was a municipal pool. And when the team arrived and tried to enter the gate, one of them was stopped and not allowed to enter. He was uh, a young boy, young black kid uh, by the name of Al Bright, um, who was on the team. And his parents had not been able to attend the game. Although some of the, the site, as someone at the site pleaded for him to be let in, the only thing the lifeguards were willing to do was to place a blanket outside the fence and allow people to bring him food as he watched his teammates splash in the water and chase each other around. Um, that re really got to me. And after, uh, uh, I think after much pleading, somebody was pleading, a supervisor did agree to let the young boy in the pool for a few minutes, but only on the condition that the other boys would get out of the pool first. After all, the white folks were, after all the white folks were out of the pool, they allowed Al Bright to be escorted to a small rubber raft and be pushed around by a lifeguard who continued to warn Al not to touch the water. Whatever you do, just don't touch the water, he kept saying. And after those few agonizing moments, the young boy was then escorted to his spot outside the fence to watch his teammates having fun. And the lifeguard managed to keep the water pure that day, but a part of that, you know, little boy must have died that, that afternoon. When one of the coaches offered him a ride home, he refused it. Um, he had his championship trophy in his hand and he refused it. He walked the, the mile or so back home by himself. He was never the same after that. Had a terrible in, uh, impact on him and his psyche. So in our history is replete with so many examples of how whites demean, humiliated, criminalized, and even murdered black people to keep the water pure. Drinking fountains, drinking glasses. Uh, if you uh, had touched a drinking glass in some places, they would destroy it. Uh, and there's been a lot of examples of how uh, things happen in the ocean when blacks tried to uh, take advantage of the water. Um, so she, you know, as I said, she, that's one of, one of the examples that I just threw out, but there, she has a number of them. Um, and, but most of them, and this is a criticism of the book, is that uh, most of the examples she uses about examples of how the caste system intrudes upon uh, uh, everything in this country. She uses uh, a lot of her personal, professional, and middle-class life examples, but misses some of the influences of, of uh, the system on poor people. Um, well, I was disappointed that Wilkerson does not clearly define or uh, include major concepts related to race and, and black and white relationships in America. She tells us that race uh, is a social construct that, that had its origins in the country during the period of enslavement. And although she, she suggests the systemic nature of racism at times, she does not define it or include it in her examination of our caste system. Yet her definition of the concept of race seems quite similar to that of structural or systemic racism. I haven't been able to, to tell the difference from, uh, from her book in terms of how she uses these concepts. As well, she all but ignores, as I mentioned before, class that so many scholars before her include in their discussions, their research, and their analysis of race and class. Uh, but there's been some recent research uh, that has shown us that Blacks who are are convicted of killing whites are much more likely to be executed. Dustin, Dustin Higgins, I think was, was uh, oh, this was a recent one. He uh, was executed on January 11th of this year and became the last execution carried out by Trump. And it was, it was, it was really heartbreaking because if the execution could have been stayed for six more days, his death sentence would not have been carried out under Biden. Um, 
And the execution was was it's sort of close to home for me because Higgins was a, a friend of my nephew. They were classmates. But, um, and we also know that blacks are more likely to be killed by police as well. So um, since whites occupy the dominant caste, they, they use their power and position against blacks whenever they wish. And I, I, I wanna recall, I don't know if you remember Amy, uh, Cooper in Central Park um, when she was walking uh, her do dog and, and uh, took the leash off, she felt entitled to break the law and use it against the Black man who was there complaining by the name of Christopher Cooper when he asked her to leash her dog as required by law. I mean, she, she took her phone <laughs> and called a uh, uh, 911 and and claim that she was being abused by this man. And Wilkerson um, points out that the expectations and values we place on each other are automatic and instinctive. And this is borne out by relatively recent empirical research, actually. There was um, a one study I read, uh, Yale Law Journal, um, uh, looks in, looking at the systemic and implicit bias. One study, one of those studies found that uh, people automatically devalue the lives of Black Americans compared to white Americans. Another study uh, showed how Americans automatically, uh, automatic conceptions of punishment have become cognitively inseparable from race. People implicitly associate uh, retributive concepts with Blacks, like things like revenge, payback, punish, and they um, associate leniency with whites, forgiveness, redemption, compassion. I think these studies illustrate how deeply ingrained uh, cultural forces tend to promote both the undervaluing and over punishment of Black lives across the justice system including juvenile justice and how they give support to Wilkerson's assertion that we act almost instinctively. I did have sort of an aha moment um, from Wilkerson's book and it came from her assertion that people in this country see, judge and relate to each other based on race. And it is instantaneous and often unconscious. This I have always believed. I know there are those who will disagree but ignored in addressing my concepts about influence of racism over the years. It seems quite likely that we all make instantaneous judgments about people and their culturally assigned place or position in this uh, hierarchical caste system that she talks about. Each of our reactions to the social construct of race is, is an automatic, instinctive, an unconscious judgment about a person's worth or value in that system. I concur with Wilkerson's assertion that the judgment is there, although it might be in one's subconscious. Hence, they don't realize it. And these instinctive and unconscious judgments work both ways between those in the dominant class and those in the inferior class. And I've told people this many times, you know, uh, that Black people, uh, you know, feel inferior because they've been socialized just like white people to believe that there is that difference. Um, so, but the most damage obviously it, to humans is done by the dominant caste members um, because that is where the economic, social and political power primarily resides. And then one other uh, thing I want to mention, but I, I subscribe to uh, Wilson's belief that we instinctively see and relate to race based on this caste system. And I don't think that that would change anytime soon because it's so ingrained in our culture. What does and has changed is, of course, how we respond to it and how we treat each other. And those responses, I believe, can be changed. And they are changed due to uh, laws, uh, education, practices, uh, and convenience. 
economically, politically, and socially, if it's convenient, you do change. Unfortunately, she fails to consider the influence of class, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in our racial judgments. How does it weigh in on our judgments and treatment of others? That I don't think we know. Um, as I said, other writers have thinks it's important. However, she uses, uh, again, mostly examples of how Black professionals and upper middle class Blacks such as uh, such as her are inconvenienced and discriminated against by the caste system and ignores the impact of the system on the poor, the incarcerated, and the disenfranchised. And lastly, I just want to mention that uh, I was interested, I'm interested in social change um, and how do we, in, in terms of how do we change the American caste system? Well, Wilkerson's book added much to my understanding of caste and its history and the role in American society and our personal lives. It left me struggling, however, with how to change this rigid hierarchical system that is so deeply ingrained in our psyche and our culture. For her, the first step is to understand the caste system itself. She says that you can't change what you don't know. And Dollar maintained that as well, that you can't understand race until you under, uh, he says you can't understand race until you understand caste. So it's, that's kind of an uh, interesting dynamic. <laughs> um, Wilkerson uh, certainly envisions a world without a caste system. This is her positive piece. She believes that uh, the American caste system can be eliminated in due time. And she notes that it can be done and she points to Germany as, as an example, uh, which I thought was interesting. And in her chapter, she has a chapter called The Heart is the Last Frontier. She suggests a number of rather idealistic approaches to destroying the American caste system, suggesting that social change requires only the changing of the dominant caste members' attitudes and behaviors. It includes such things as pointing out how everyone benefits when we meet the needs of disadvantage, calling for public accounting and what the caste system has cost us. And that could be accomplished through, she suggests, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, similar to that which took place after the end of the South African apartheid. So you can't resolve anything you, uh, you can't admit exists, she says. We must make the country's injustices known to the world. She also uh, recognizes that there is a moral duty attached to privilege that we should all recognize. The price you pay is to act against injustice. And she also talks about uh, acting on injustice that we witness. If, if we see something uh, and you say nothing, uh, that inaction keeps the mechanism of the cast running. Uh, so, you, so if you see, for instance, uh, a, a police shooting of a black person and you don't uh, do anything about it, and, uh, condemn it, then you're part of the problem. And she says also that you need to engage in radical empathy that includes listening to others. I think you know these are these are nice things, and you know, and uh, I, but I can't quite buy her unrealistic pre prescription for change. As a social activist, uh, I sort of subscribe to the teachings and actions of great black leaders like Martin Luther King, Ella Baker, and Frederick Douglass, who reminded us that. Of several things. Power concedes nothing without demand. It never did and it never will. Um, that's what Douglas said. And he went on to say that if there is no struggle, there is no progress. As a social activist, I believe that it is within my power to change the power structure. And Wilkerson fails to adequately acknowledge also um, the historical resistance to racism that increases daily. The Black Lives Movement rejects the devaluation of Black lives that is thought to be uh, basically you know, a pillar of the caste system. It is Black resistance that paved the way for major changes in this racist society. They did not wait for white people to change their attitudes and behaviors. 
they force those changes. So it seems unlikely um, to me that the American caste system based on race will change in the foreseeable future. But what can change is how individuals, institutions, and systems respond to it. And that is happening to some extent. For instance, it has become cultural suicide to use the N word in public. Uh, recall the recent incident of the Albany police officer who was overheard using a racial epithet when referring to black people. Um, you know, there was really an outrage over that. There are, of course, many other changes taking place to correct injustice. But ultimately, I don't think it, it, may, it may not matter whether the caste system ends. Placing people in the caste system according to their race won't matter much if we empower the lower class to assert their rights, win equal treatment, gain majority political power, and achieve uh, equal access to the nation's goods and services. And that's what we've been um, focusing on and continue to focus on in, um, at least in Albany. And I think around the country that's, that's happening to a great extent. So I'm gonna stop there, <laughs> almost losing my voice. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. I don't want you to lose your voice, but I did <laughs> want to, to thank you for, for, for coming. And I wanted to ask again, people, if they had questions, they could, they don't have to type the whole question, but even if they would just type the word in the, in the, uh, the chat thing that they want to ask a question and they could ask the question, they don't have to type the whole thing. I don't want everyone to like call, come at you all at once and, um, no one can hear what the heck is being asked. So if any of you, any of you have any questions that you would like to ask of Alice, you just type in, type, type in the word question in, in the little um, chat box and, I, I, and I'll direct you there. Uh, um, in the meantime, I, Alice, I had a question. You, did you, you read The Warmth of Other Sons? Oh, yes. Did you think that that was, a, do you, that it was useful to read it before reading cast or do you think it didn't matter as much? I'm not so sure it matters that much. Uh, it, 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 to me, it was a very different uh, look at our history. Um, and uh, it focused on individuals and um, you know what happens to them during this migration period. Mm -hmm. So I, she didn't talk a lot of, uh, you know, about those things that she's mentioning in the book. So I. I I don't think it matters if you read which one you read first. That's my okay. sense. But she said one led to the other. She, she, and so I'm not sure why she thought that. <laughs> Actually, I saw her on um, book uh, on C-SPAN, and she was being interviewed about the, the current book. But she talked a lot about her previous book and mm -hmm. how, when she was doing the research, it just right. led her down that the, the path that led her to. Uh, Right, it led yes. us, but I don't know if it's important to read that first. And, uh, but it does help to understand that you know the history of the of the, the migration and going into a land where you know now we have closer uh, or more issues related to the the relationship between the, the blacks and whites in this country. Hey, Frank, do you want to ask Frank Robinson? Do you want to ask your question? Or... OK, well, I can ask it uh, verbally. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was surprised that the uh, book hardly mentioned subject of education. Would you like to yeah. comment? Yeah, 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 I've heard you, you mentioned education. I, I'm not, you know, um, and I'm not sure. Uh, I've heard you talk about it. But can you refresh my memory why you think that is uh, a key issue to be addressed in this book? It's my personal feeling that um, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, obstacles to dealing with the, the caste problem that we have in America, the, the racism caste problem, as you've discussed. And I feel that education, if we ensured real equality of education, that would go a long way toward rectifying the impacts of the problem. And we could do that. Yeah. 
Well, I can't disagree with that, but uh, education doesn't mean that you're going to be uh, accepted as an equal in this country. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to believe that, but uh, I can't. But it, one of the things it does, of course, if you have uh, education and you can um, uh, you know, climb the, the economic ladder, uh, I think that, that helps a lot in terms of how you feel about yourself and what you're able to do and the power that you that you get to make some changes in this country. So education for me is, is a major uh, uh, goal to reach, I agree with you. But I don't think, you see with this, I, it doesn't guarantee me anything because so, I've seen so many times when uh, people who are well-educated, uh, who uh, again, the class issue gets left out of there, uh, who are uh, upper class, um, they can't get a taxi in New York City. They can't, there are a lot of things they can't do because, uh, or even houses, uh, you know, a lot of things you can't do because you still have people out there judging you by your race, you know? And, um, but I think education will certainly um, change the dynamics to a great extent. Uh, I'm not as optimistic that it's going to get rid of, um, you know, this, uh, superiority in inferiority uh, problem that comes with the caste system. Okay, uh, Larry, uh, on the U, uh, the U phone eight, can you ask your question? Yes. And not mute yourself, yes. Tell me when. Right. Hello, I'm, my, I'm with uh, Larry Gambino. I'm Linda Hunt and I'm also registered. Um, Ms. Green, the question I am grappling with in, in this book, in reading this book is the following. Um, in addition to, you know, our, our myths about uh, we, we're either, we're not racist or we're post-racist or whatever mm -hmm. we are, there are two other myths, intersecting myths in my mind. One is, well, anybody can, you know, anybody can, um, you're not stuck in a class, you're not stuck in a cast, you're not, stuck anywhere you always have um you always can can um change your station in life i can remember right typing out little kids books um and one first grader said i love mrs so-and-so because she always gives you another chance he had bought it and he probably got it too but that's another matter so there's the we we are not stuck in place myth and then there's the um, we're, we're exceptional people as Americans, but, and, and the other part of that is, is the exceptional uh, person of color, this exceptional black person, the exceptional blind person, you know, uh, so that, 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 that means um, that we're not cast. I guess I'm saying that we're not in a cast. I guess what I'm really saying is that, that I think these other myths it, it's a great intellectual exercise and she does a very lot to support it, her book, excuse me, but I, but I do think that these other concepts um, that I've just mentioned, um, those are my kind of concerns about the book. Mm -hmm. Well, I wish but, that was true. <laughs> um, I, I wish that, you know, people weren't stuck. You have to understand what she's saying. Um, when mm -hmm. you see a black person, you, you don't just see a black person. You see a person and you assign some something in terms of yes. value to that person. And I, you know, I have, uh, you can say it all you want to, but when you look at me, you do not see me in the same way you see a white woman. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't have to call you a racist. I'm just saying you do not see me the same. And then you make some decisions. And as I said, a lot of times it's sub subconscious, but you make a decision, you make a judgment about the value of that person. You see me as someone who came from uh, enslaved people. You see me as someone who is not quite the same, uh, you know, and, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of time that's, negative if you see me as little inferior not equal. i understand that not from being totally blind i understand exactly what you're saying so you're saying that are you also saying that therefore we are stuck we we aren't seen 
be because of that initial reaction, we aren't seeing yeah. this and people, from our place. Well, people, re people respond to it differently based on your experience, uh, your knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, your, you know, a, a lot of things. You might not, you know, you might, it might not be apparent to you at the time. Okay. Yeah, bias. Uh, and you can change how you re you respond to me, as I said, based on a number of things, education, mm -hmm. experience, and all of that. But because uh, everybody doesn't approach me as a, in a negative way, they don't say, well, "Miss Alice Green, she's black." So, blah, blah, blah. you know. Um, but I'm talking about that initial reaction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or or instinct that goes on that says that you are different than me. Yeah. And you're not putting me on the same level, and you're judging. You see, I believe that all that all people are uh, socialized um, under the uh, white supremacy. I mean, it's, I, I I don't. I wish that were not so. Uh, as I said, I grew up in a town that was all white. I learned very early that I was not the same. Nobody thought of me as being the same. They thought of me as being less than them. Okay, and I had to deal with that. It took a while, and some of those people um, uh, who discriminated against me at that point said, oh, I didn't know that was happening to you. Yes, it was happening to me. You didn't invite me to your birthday party. You didn't invite me to socialize with you, you know? So um, it's, it's, it's very complex sometimes, but the fact is that it exists, and I don't know if the caste system, I don't know when it, we can ever uh, get rid of it because it's so deeply ingrained. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that someday it does. We get to a point that we are all on the same, you know, level. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to get uh, uh, Alice. Do you have a response to any of this or all of this? Well, she did. Roger. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, Roger. I I, yes, I want to endorse what uh, Alice was saying. Was a very simple example. Uh, in this retirement community, we have uh, people who come in and will fix the computer for you. And when the white guy walks in the door, my immediate reaction is, oh, good, here's Floyd. He's going to fix my computer. When the black guy walks in the door, I think, oh, is he going to fix my computer? Now, he's been here a couple of times, and I don't think that anymore, but that's my immediate almost unconscious reaction. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can get away from that. I don't think you can eliminate that at all. I think it's, it's always going to be there. And what you have to do is realize that you're doing it and try not to do it. Right, I, I agree with you. It's there. <laughs> We, yeah, we, deny it's, it's it. there. We, we deny it, but it's there. I have, I have yeah. another question I'd like to somebody ask. Winston asks, how could truth and reconciliation work? Biden is calling for social justice. Oh, because it's basically saying that, you know, you can't change something that you don't know. You need to know more about how it impacts people. So, and you have to think about yourself, like this uh, 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 lady here was saying, you know, I. She's saying, uh, I find myself doing that, or I did find myself doing that. And she's basically saying, examine yourself, <laughs> be honest with yourself, uh, and uh, then, then we can go from there, okay? So that truth uh, brings out uh, uh, an, an opportunity to have some reconciliation. But if you deny it, you know, I'm not gonna talk to you. <laughs> but is it is it is is that possible in a in a collective sense, or is that yeah, a bunch you know three hundred thirty million people doing that all the time? Yeah, not in a collective sense. I don't think so. You know, um, it, if you look at what happened in South Africa, I mean that was uh, it wasn't a perfect opportunity. We tried to do that here uh, uh, in a a, a a project that we're doing called Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation to allow trying to find a way to allow people who are directly impacted by uh, the criminal justice system, particularly policing, to talk about that and the people who are involved in it, who are, had the power to recognize what the 
sometimes they did uh, in their work and how they treated people differently. If you can get to that point, there's some hope that we can one day get to, you know, <laughs> get rid of this, this caste system that's part of us. Alice, I have another question from Elizabeth. She wants to know what you think was what has been happening in Germany as described in the book. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. The ger with the German experience as described in, in, that she described in the book. What the, was their happening? sort of truth and reconciliation, for lack of a better word. The, the fact that they that they, they addressed the, the, the Nazi uh, experience and how they addressed that. Oh Something yeah, like that. right. That's, that's, that's uh, the example she uses that uh, in Germany now, uh, of course, uh, they've done a number of things to uh, uh, correct what, 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 what happened during, during uh, Nazi Germany. And she talks to some extent about the, uh, you know, how the, uh, the German community country actually <laughs> uh, doesn't have to talk, they don't talk about it. It's, it's been eliminated from, you know, the central core of their existence there. And that uh, um, we don't have the same kind of things like the statues that we have. We talked about statues uh, that, that commemorate the, uh, the Confederacy and all of that. They don't have that. Um, they've been able to look at themselves and say, this was, you know, this has happened and this was wrong. And they, they've been able to go beyond that. So uh, I think that um, unfortunately, I, like to, I would like to know a lot more about how that process actually uh, uh, worked because I think it, it's something that we, you know, we need to know if we're, if we're really serious about trying how to, uh, to, to find ways to get rid of it. Jean, can you tell me what the German stumbling stones are? <laughs> sure. So, um, you would be, well, I, I can illustrate it from um, something that happened to uh, my husband and me when we were in Paris a number of years ago. We were just walking down the street and we noticed that there was a, uh, something embedded in the sidewalk as we were walking and we stopped to read it. And it uh, was talking to about the building there, which had been a preschool, or maybe it still was a preschool. And it, it talked about the number of um, children, Jewish children, who had been taken from that preschool and sent to the mm -hmm. camps. Mm -hmm. And so there's just this moment when you're stumbling across it and suddenly you, you become aware of, of things. And I was just thinking that in this country where every, there ought to be a stumbling stone every place that somebody was mm -hmm. lynched. Mm -hmm. There ought to be a stumbling stone in Albany where um, somebody died from uh, police brutality. So mm -hmm. it's it's a way of sort of um, uh, sort of uh, infusing the, the the public consciousness. Right, and I think Brian Stevenson does that to some extent. You know, uh, in terms of lynching, um, but uh, you know, we we should be cel we should be celebrating and remembering those people who were victimized, both in Nazi Germany and in this country. And that's, they've been able to do it better in Nazi, in, in Germany. Um, but why should I, you know, we had this argument when we were talking about the statue of, uh, <laughs> in Albany in front of City Hall. Why, why should I glorify somebody who enslaved me and stole uh, my ancestors' labor and put black people in the situation they're in now? Um, you know, I, I, I shouldn't have to do, <laughs> think about that. But um, you know, I think we I think we need to do something like that. Okay, uh, Frank, do you want to give a plug to your 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 talk? You're gonna have a bit discussion on this book. Um, the Capital District Humanist Society is going to be. Uh, uh, discussing this book. <laughs> we, we go very slowly through a book chapter by chapter, virtually page by page over uh, a period of months. Um, and if anybody is interested in uh, getting involved in that, they could email me. I'll, I'll put my uh, email in the, the chat one more time. It's frank at fsrcoin.com. 
and there it is in the chat if anybody's interested. Okay. We nope. did that with Michelle Alexander's book, by the way, and it took us uh, almost 10 years. I, I yeah. can believe that. Good. Chapter by chapter, then we took out issues and uh, everybody was so interested in it that it, it, uh, it was going from uh, 2010 until the recent uh, pandemic shut us down. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, Seth, that sounds great. Seth has a, has a request. He <laughs> would like you to summarize what progressive white people can actively do right uh, now to okay. help overcome the okay. caste system. That is always a, I always, I always, we always get that question, what can, what can you do? Uh, Beyond their personal con, you right. know, consciousness. So, stuff. I, think you, I think you know what you have to do. <laughs> I always think it put, take, uh, put it back on the person. Uh, I think you know why you're in a situation that other people aren't. I think you know how, you know, you've been uh, granted uh, uh, a, a number of things uh, that uh, other people haven't. I think you know a lot you know, about who you are and why you're in your situation and other people aren't. All you got to do is look around, you know, and take a walk in Albany and, and try to figure out, you know, where people live, why they're in certain situations and, uh, you know, why you're in a, an advantage situation. I think you know that. Uh, there are some books you can, you can, you know, can uh, look at to, <laughs> uh, and read. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't think I can tell you how, how to be anti-racist, even though there are a number of books that are there. With, with this book, she's not, she's saying, she doesn't use the word, um, I mean, she, she's not concerned with identifying people as racist or not racist, okay? It's that, it's this system that we have set up. So, uh, I think, I think most white people know what their advantage is. <laughs> and why other people don't have it. Okay. Are there any are there any other questions? Can Can you hear me? Yes, John. Uh, okay. Um, actually, uh, I want to thank you, Alice, for uh, giving an interesting talk about a book that I haven't read. Um, and I wanted to try out on you um, uh, some thoughts I'd had. There's a saying I heard many years ago. Um, uh, don't trust Whitey. You can never tell what he's going to do. And is that uh, something that you've heard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hear okay, it every well, day. Let me, let me, I hear, I hear my, it every day. You know, okay. I, and I'm going well, to point my, my experience, you know, because as I told you, I grew up in a white community. And, uh, you know, it, it was difficult. And I was taught that white people were superior to me. And then when I got to Albany and I started, <laughs> I started being around uh, different kinds of white people and saw that they were, uh, uh, they, they committed dom domestic violence. They had alcohol problems. They had a whole bunch of things. I was angry with them because they told me they were superior to me. And, uh, and I, so then it, 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 it hurt me. I mean, I don't, didn't have it, it. It it certainly dealt me a blow, and that trust was was uh, mistrust grew because they told me something. It was almost like Santa Claus, you know, like when you find out there's no Santa, there's no Santa Claus, and then you start <laughs> the mistrusting uh, tales that people are telling you. Well, my biggest ones that white people told me they were superior to me. Yeah, well, um, I'm. <laughs> I'm not very skillful at asking these questions because I think I got you started on the wrong. Oh, act. okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, the second part of the second part of the the statement was because you can never tell what he's going to do, and I thought mm -hmm. there are actually two ways of taking that. One of them is a very literal way, is that um, it understands that white people are a huge population, and there's tons of differences amongst them. And so if all, once you know their skin color, you really don't know much of anything else about them, um, except maybe for a lot of times they think they're superior, but maybe they don't. I mean, yeah. in an individual case, you can never be sure. That's right. Um, and then the other side of it was um, that if you take it sort of figuratively, 
Um, if Whitey trans- pretends to be a friend, you better not trust him because you don't know what he's going to do when his pals get after him for um, being friendly to you. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. um, uh, I, I come at the the problem, I guess, from a, thinking that um, if you talk about caste or class or education or merit and so on, that's in some sense very abstract. And when you get to the real life things, you know, I look at you, as soon as you open your mouth, I think you, maybe you're smarter than I am. So um, <laughs> I, we all update our first impressions depending on uh, what we, um, you know, learn after that. Yes. And yes. so um, yeah. I think what you're saying is the best way for us to approach this is to, um, you know, the first impressions we're kind of stuck with, they're automatic. What you have to be able to do is to um, register, oh, there's something that doesn't fit, and maybe you want to change my attitude towards this particular person on the basis of more information. Right. Now, right. I was wondering what you think about yeah, well, my two interpretations is, of that. Yeah, mistrust is the real issue for black people. We have a whole history. That's one of the things, for instance, we're dealing with now with the, the COVID uh, uh, problem, uh, virus problem. We're finding it so di- difficult to convince uh, people in the black community that they should take uh, the, the virus, I mean, the uh, vaccine. People that I never thought would say no to it are saying, oh, there's too much history here of mistrust of white people and uh, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, so there's that, that long history there that makes you, you know, you're not sure. Um, you know, black people have, have not been at the table that long. You know, you might you might present yourself as in one way, but when you're in closed doors, you present yourself in an entirely different way. So we never know whether you really uh, like us or uh, are racist or whatever, because it's that history is still there. We're built. We're dealing with this in uh, the police department right now. We talk about this all the time. Uh, people don't trust that system because they see it as racist. And so, and that, that uh, you know, hurts a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, and, and, you know, you, so you can't accept things. I mean, we've had individual experiences where somebody would be friendly to us and then all of a sudden one day they slip and they use the N-word. And then they say, oh my God, I don't use that. I say, yeah, of course you do. <laughs> you just, it just slipped <laughs> out, right? So you never know uh, who to trust. It, and a lot of it's based on race and the history of that whole experience. I, I hate Can to, I, it, uh, John, I'm sorry, question. but we've come to the end of the hour and I want to oh, respect okay. people's yep. time. But I really want to thank you again, Alice, for, for, particip- for sharing uh, your great wisdom. And, and, and she probably is smarter than both of us, John. <laughs> <laughs> Probably possibly smarter than both of us together. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, we will again meet in a couple of weeks and, and check the, the Albany Public Library calendar. And thank you very much for coming. Okay, thanks for the invite. Thank you.